Welcome to the Capital Budgeting Cash Flows um, first session, series of two sessions. Um, our learning goals are following. We're going to discuss the three major cash flows components in this session. We're also going to look at what is actually called relevant cash flows, what is the uh, difference between expansion versus replacement decisions, defining sunk cost and opportunity cost. We'll look at an example as well. And we are going to look at how the uh, international capital budgeting uh, works. Um, also, uh, we are going to calculate the initial investment associated with the proposed capital expenditure. We'll discuss the tax implication associated with the sale of an old asset. Now, let's start with these. What are the relevant cash flows to a project? These are called incremental cash flows. Uh, why incremental? Because these are the additional cash flows, which includes outflows and inflows expected to result from a proposed capital expenditure. So for a firm, there's an existing asset base, which is creating certain cash flow. Now, by adopting a new asset or new project, this project will have new assets, and these assets will create new or additional cash flows. So the, whether the project is feasible or not, we do not need to look at the firm's existing cash flows. We have to look at the project new cash flows, which is called the additional cash flows or more mostly the incremental cash flow. It's also called incremental cash flow analysis. So following are the major cash flow components uh, used in incremental cash flow. The cash flows of any project may include three basic components. The first is initial investment, which means we buy an asset. The relevant cash flow for a proposed project at time zero. This means when we are drawing a timeline at zero, we are going to buy an asset. And this will be a negative cash flow, which means cash outflow. Operating cash flows, the incremental after tax cash inflows resulting from implementation of the project during its life. Now, once we bought it, we should be getting certain inflows at project, you know, different time periods. It's not necessary that it will start um, giving us inflows immediately after we buy an asset, maybe after a few years, maybe after um, some time and uh, maybe immediately. So there could be different cases to it. Then there is a terminal cash flow. So we have to find out, let's say it's a seven year project, then what is the terminal cash flow at this point of time? This is the after tax non operating cash flow occurring in the final year of the project. It is usually attributed attributable to liquidation of the project. So here at this point, we are going to liquidate the project or assets and sell it. The amount comes inside the company. So it's kind of inflow. Um, and, and, and this is non-operating because we are liquidating, we are not using the asset in a regular operation of the business. So the, this is more of a better version of the graph that I was trying to make in the last slide. You can see the components uh, precisely positioned here. For instance, initial investment is at point zero and operating cash flows, uh, which means that the project is earning uh, or the machine employed or the asset that is purchased is used in creating these cash flows are at the end of the year for the last for, for 10 years. And then we have the terminal cash flow, which is actually the uh, cash flow or inflow from liquidating the asset. Asset and that is around $25,000. And uh, this is a complete project uh, cash flows. Now let's look at uh, different um, uh, definitions and vocabulary relevant to capital budgeting. The first is expansion versus the replacement decisions. Expansions are pretty easy. It's because there is an initial investment, then there is operating cash flows, and then there is terminal cash flows. However, replacement decisions are difficult apart because replacement means that we are trying to replace an existing machine or asset with a new machine. This means that the, the existing machine has to be sold and 
um, a new machine has to be purchased. So there is some uh, um, um, financing coming, some financing or some cash flow coming from the replacement decisions um, uh, to support or to finance the new assets. Now, this uh, uh, required that we identify the incremental cash outflow inflow that would result from the proposed replacement. This is an important um, component. And let's look at it. So here is the graphical depiction of the replacement decisions. We have initial investment, which is equal to the initial investment needed to acquire new asset. And we subtract it from the after tax cash inflows from liquidation of old asset. Technically, if you look at it, this is financing the new asset as well. Similarly, we do it for operating cash flows. We are operating cash flows from new asset minus operating cash flow from old asset and terminal cash flow is the after tax cash flows for, from termination of new asset or liquidation and then after tax cash flows from the termination of old assets. If we uh, make all these equals to zero, 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 then this becomes the entire project becomes the expansion project. So essentially, all uh, projects are replacement decision. Um, so the expansion projects are the, are the ones where the uh, um, old assets cash flows are zeros, whether they are the initial operating or the terminal cash flows. Let's look at a few more definitions. For instance, sunk cost and opportunity cost. We'll also discuss it through examples. So sunk costs are cash outlays uh, that have already been made and therefore have no effect on the cash flow relevant to current decision. And these sunk costs should not be included in the project incremental cash flows. Let's take an example, a more theoretical example. For instance, a firm conducts a feasibility study to uh, acquire a project or to set up a project. Now, if the feasibility decision could be um, positive, then the firm will go ahead and uh, purchase the assets and make investments. If the feasibility reports is negative, for instance, it says that um, it will not create uh, incremental cash flows or it's not creating additional value, then the firm will not pursue it. In both the cases, the firm will already taken into account the cost. It will already had charged or expensed the costs. There is no need for shifting that cost to the project if it is accepted. In both the cases, whether accepted or rejected, this feasibility study cost has to be borne by the firm conducting that feasibility study. Then comes the um, opportunity costs. These are the costs that cash flow that could be realized from the best alternative used of owned asset. So we have heard this opportunity cost a lot. Next best alternative or next best use. So opportunity costs should be included as cash outflows when one is determining a project incremental cash flows. Let's, let's look at an example of sunk cost and opportunity cost. JE is considering renewing its drill machine X202, which it purchased three years earlier for $237,000. By retrofitting, now they're going to fit something, um, retrofitting it with the computerized control system from an obsolete piece of equipment it owns. The obsolete equipment could be sold today for a high bid of $42,000, but without its computerized control system, it would be worth nothing. So the first question is, what constitutes sunk cost here? And as we can see, that X202 was purchased three years earlier for $237. Should ask yourself question whether $237,000 three years earlier price is relevant today? So this constitutes sunk cost. This is no more relevant to the current decisions uh, of um, acquiring project or renewing its drill machine. $237,000 has no bearing on whether the JE should renew it or it should not renew it. This price was three years old and it is at that time it could have been of any consequence but right now it has of no, uh, it has no impact. Now, what constitute opportunity cost? The firm JE owns an obsolete, obsolete equipment. Now this obsolete equipment has a computerized 
control system. This computerized control system is worth forty-two thousand dollars. Without obsolete, without this computer control system, obsolete equipment is of zero value. So, the opportunity cost is the the forty-two thousand dollars constitute the opportunity cost. So, in essence, the proposed use of the computerized um, uh, control system represents an opportunity cost of $42,000, the highest price at which it could be sold today. So let's look at the international capital budgeting and long-term investment issues and challenges. Uh, the international capital budgeting differs from the domestic version because of foreign currency risk and political risk. Foreign currency risk is because the currency fluctuates against dollars and um, this creates uh, 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 this fluctuation fluctuation is creates risks because now the value of the currency changes hence the cost of the project will either increase or decrease according to change in uh, the currency value this has to be covered and it can be covered in two ways one either the foreign investment should be partly uh, financed through local capital market and second by using forward future and option market these are the derivative contracts and these contracts actually helps uh, hedge or insure the investor from the um, currency risks. Then we have foreign investments. It entail potentially significant political risk. One government preferences is different than the other. Hence, it poses a risk of how the earlier products would be implemented or uh, run. And since the projects are, projects are uh, sp spanned over longer time, the political risk is huge. These can also be uh, minimized through different types of uh, using financial strategies. Uh, one of the way the investment comes to a country is through foreign direct investment, which includes the transfer of capital, managerial and technical assets to a foreign country. You'll be surprised that US um, and uh, second to US is China that attracts the most foreign uh, direct investment. Now, uh, what is the basic format for determining initial investment? It includes uh, three parts. The first one is the installed cost of new asset. It's the cost of new asset plus installation cost. The cost of new, uh, new asset is the net outflow, while the installation cost is the added cost that are necessary to place an asset into operation. So which means we are implementing an asset. The machine uh, needs to be placed in a, pos in a position. There has to be fixing of the machine with the specific area, uh, specific position, specific place, etc. These all will call, uh, cause uh, installation cost. That will be added to this. So the installed cost of new asset is the cost of new asset plus its installation cost equals the asset depreciable value. That should be equal to assets depreciable value. And then we will depreciate it through using the depreciation schedule. Then we have after tax proceed from sale of old asset. Uh, this includes liquidating the old asset and also either we will have the um, uh, tax uh, plus or minus on sale of old asset. Uh, tax plus minus uh, plus minus uh, means basically either the, mm, the tax will be paid to the government or there will be certain refund. So it depends on the book value. We'll look at this in, in a moment. Then there is a third part which is change in networking capital. So this will uh, yield. Um, so networking capital is the account receivable minus accounts payable. So the short term um, uh, minus the uh, short term uh, receivables minus the short term payables. Now, initial investment of cash flow is one minus two. So we subtract the after tax proceed from sale of old asset from the installed cost of new asset. And then it depends on change in networking capital, whether it's plus and minus, and we um, add or subtract as a third component. First, let's try to understand the uh, book value of an asset. In st strictly speaking, in accounting, the book value is uh, equals to the installed cost of asset uh, minus the accumulated depreciation. 
let's go through this example and find out what's the book value of an asset. So HI, a small electronics company, two years ago acquired a machine tool with an installed cost of $100,000. Now under, under modified uh, accelerated cost recovery system, for a five year recovery period, the depreciation allocated is around 20% and 32% of the installed cost for the two years. This will constitute around, this is 52% of the $100,000 cost or $52,000 dollars of accumulated depreciation so now we have the um, uh, accumulated depreciation we have the installed cost of the asset as well so the book value will be equal to at the end of two years hundred thousand dollars minus fifty two two thousand dollars this is the installed cost of asset and 52,000 is the accumulated depreciation at the end of the two years so the book value left or the book value of the asset is $48,000. Now, let's look at the tax treatment on sale of assets. This is very important. Um, so gain on sale of asset, uh, if this is the case, the portion of the sale price that is greater than the book value. So uh, in other words, the gain will be realized when there is the uh, sale price minus the book value of an asset so if this is greater this relationship is you know greater sale price greater than book value then all gains above book value are taxed as ordinary income and assumed tax rate so far we have uh, used is 40 percent then similarly if there is a loss on sale of asset which means this relationship is this sale price is less than the book value then there are two possibilities if the asset is depreciable and used in business loss is deducted from an ordinary income and then we have the same 40 percent of loss and it's a tax saving uh, if the asset is not depreciable or is not used in business loss is deductible only against capital gains so this is and and, and the assumed tax rate is again 40 percent these are the two possibilities in case of the loss now let's look at this example and we'll uh, restructure this example in terms of a graph in the next slide. Uh, if HI sells the old asset for $110,000, so it bought it at $100,000 installed cost, and now it sold it for $100,000, it realizes a gain of $62,000. And why it is $62,000? Because now, if you see $110,000 minus the book value, which is $48,000 and $62,000. The gain is made up of now two parts. The one is the what called capital gain and the other is the recaptured depreciation. Which is the, what is recaptured depreciation? It is the portion of an asset sale price that is above book value and below its initial price. And that's going to look at graphically more. It will bring more clarity. The capital gain is $10,000 because we bought it $100,000 and we sold it at $110,000. So the difference $10,000 is capital gain. And recaptured depreciation is $52,000, which is the, uh, which is the uh, accumulated depreciation that we calculated for the first two years. And this is $100,000 minus the book value. This is the other way to calculate or you can calculate the book value from the accumulated depreciation or accumulated or, uh, or here in this case, we have subtracted the book value from the initial purchase price to get the uh, recaptured depreciation. The total gain above book value of $62,000 is taxed as ordinary income at 40% rate and that results in $24,000, uh, $24,800. Now let's look at this in a uh, graphical form. Let's look at the example in a graphical form and uh, so this uh, on this side we are going to present the sale of sale price. So if you remember we have initial price, the initial cost or initial purchase price, I'll write it IPP, initial purchase price was hundred thousand dollars then we made a 52 percent 
depreciation for two years. So the book value was equals to $48,000. And this 52%, which amounts to $52,000, is the accumulated depreciation. We'll come to this in a moment. So this is the, let me draw it. And so right now, this amounts to accumulated depreciation of um, $52,000. That was charged to the asset. Now book value is forty-eight thousand, and um, fifty-two thousand equals hundred thousands. Now we have the asset was sold for hundred and ten thousand. So the sale price is hundred and ten thousand dollars. Now if we see. This $110,000, we'll draw the line here. It's more than the purchase price. In fact, it's higher than the book value. So sale price is higher than the book value. By how much? So you can see here, if I draw this line between these two, it will make this concept clear that sale price is 110,000 while book value is 48,000. We actually, the, the, the company was able to uh, make a gain of uh, $62,000. Now this gain has two parts. And the first part is the, what we call recaptured depreciation. This depreciation of 52,000 was already charged. Now we have recaptured it after we sold the asset. Recaptured uh, depreciation has to be within the purchase price cannot go beyond that. Hence the second part. So this is the first part of the gains that was made. And the second part that is called capital gain. Capital gain is basically uh, equals to $10,000. It is the difference between the uh, sale price and the initial purchase price. So this is capital gain, sale price minus the initial purchase price. Recaptured depreciation is the initial purchase price minus the book value. And uh, so this is, um, uh, this is the entire depiction of the last uh, problem you can see that anything less than the book value will result in a loss and anything on this line will result in no profit no loss so uh, anything on um, equal, uh, if the sale the condition will be sale price equals to the book value if sale price equal to book value there is no profit no loss but if sale price is less than which is this case, sale price is less than the book value, then we will have a loss. And this loss has to be um, uh, incorporated and we'll see how it's done. So the first we look at the neutral position when, it, when uh, sale price equals to the book value. So if the asset is sold for exactly $48,000, which was the book value, then we will have no profit and no loss and there is there are no tax effects on the initial investments or in the new assets so we did not gain anything out of selling the old asset so there is no tax neither we lost anything now let's look at the loss part of the uh, of selling the asset if hi sells the asset for $30,000 it experiences a loss of $18,000 that is 48 minus $30,000. Uh, we'll look into the figure in the next uh, slide. So now there are two cases and we did discuss these two cases. This is the first case and this is the second case. The first case says, if this is a depreciable asset used in the business, the firm may use the loss to offset ordinary operating income. The second case is if the asset is not depreciable, 
or is not used in the business, the firm can use the loss only to offset capital gains. These are the two ways it can be implemented. But in either case, the loss will save the firm $7,200 because if you multiply the loss with the 40% tax, $7,200 comes out to be uh, the answer. And this $7,200 means that we uh, will pay $7,200 less tax um, in, 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 in the yearly tax. So if current operating earnings or capital gains are not sufficient, then that in that case, these taxes can be applied um, to the losses to prior or future years. Let's look at it in graphical form. We already discussed the initial purchase price, the sale price, this is the sale price, book value, and this is the, the 30,000 is the loss. So this, if the sale price is $30,000, then what will happen? We are selling below the book value. Book value is $48,000. So the loss is this, which is, uh, 48,000 minus 30,000 comes out to be 18,000. And 18,000 multiplied by the 40% tax will get us 7,200, which is the uh, tax uh, benefit that we will get because of this loss. It is also possible that we can have a, uh, we can have a sale price uh, of $70,000. Now, if this is the case, when we have a sale price of $70,000, what will happen? This time, $70,000 is greater than the $48,000. So, this, if we subtract it, we'll have an amount of a gain of $22,000. Now, in this $22,000, what we receive, we do not have a capital gain here. We don't have capital gain because capital gain is when you fully recapture the depreciation. In this case, we only capture the recapture depreciation to the tune of $22,000. So uh, this will be considered as a recapture depreciation rather than the um, capital gain. So in this session, we looked at the different um, uh, cash flows components. We also discussed the incremental cash flow, expansion versus replacement, sunk cost, opportunity cost, and some of the challenges in international capital budgeting like currency and political risk. We also looked at the uh, looked at how to calculate the initial investment associated with the proposed capital expenditure, both um, the expansion as well as the replacement, where we know that all projects are replacement uh, uh, and um, they can be expansion if replacement uh, equals to zero. We also discussed tax implication associated with the sale of all asset. For now, thank you.